Hi everyone and welcome to this month's Force Society for Kids Mental Health in the Know Parent Networking and Education session. My name is Julie Collette and I'm the parent in residence for the Force Society at the Kelty Mental Health Resource Center at BC Children's Hospital here in Vancouver. In a moment I will be introducing our two special guests and speakers. First, just a few housekeeping items. Please remember to fill in your feedback forms at the end of the session. If you're an online viewer, you can go to the feedback form at the bottom right, which is a little chain link. And uh, when you fill in the feedback forms, it really helps us with our future session planning. And you also get a chance to win a $50 gift card to Chapters. All the information is confidential, and we would really appreciate you taking the time. Um, lastly, uh, just thanks everybody for joining us, and tonight's topic is going to be meetings and get more from your meetings. Our two speakers are Moira Hazelhurst and Marlies McRoby, and they are both parents in residence in the Tri-Cities area. They both have boys. Moira has two boys, age 8 and 12, and Marlies has a boy, age 17. They have had ongoing journeys with their children and youth and have a lot of experience that they are wanting to share with you. So welcome, Moira and Marlies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our meeting, t or our, our um, in the know session tonight is called Get More From Meetings, The Surprising Steps to Collaboration, um, and just really wanted to welcome you to our conversation tonight. Um, as Julie said, my name is Marlise McRoby, and this is my colleague Moira Hazelhurst, and we are both uh, parents and residents in the Tri-Cities area. Uh, we've added a slide here with contact information, um, so if you wanted to get in, in contact with either one of us, you can reach us here. But more importantly, you can use this information to contact uh, perhaps your own local uh, parent and residence uh, and get connected that way. So we created this presentation especially for parents and caregivers um, who have children who face mental health challenges. Meetings of all kinds um, make up a huge part of our lives quite often uh, when we face these types of things um, as we try as parents to get the supports our children need to be successful. We created this workshop in partnership with members from the Best Practice Committee um, and you can see all their logos on the slide here. Um, this is a, a committee that we take part in that's in our local area in the Tri-Cities. Um, we also pulled this information together from other parents and residents um, across the province. We asked them for their input on what were their own favorite tips about meetings and collaboration. So tonight what we're going to discuss um, is highlights from our community survey results um, that ask parents about their experiences with meetings. We will also look at what collaboration is, what are the steps to collaborating effectively, and how to overcome trouble spots because those can happen even with you know when we have all the best intentions in the world. Um, we will also give you a couple of really great resources at the end that are specific to meetings. With the survey we conducted, our goal was to hear from parents what their experience was like uh, with all these meetings that, that we often have to attend. In partnership with the Best Practice Committee, we adapted a questionnaire um, that uh, one of the partners um, had developed for their own use. Uh, it was the Simon Fraser Society for Community Living had created a questionnaire uh, to give to parents right after a meeting to, to gauge how well the meeting had gone. Um, and we took that questionnaire and shifted it a little bit so that it would apply to all meetings uh, for all parents. Um, so we used that as a base. Uh, this went out to many families in the Tri-Cities area. We sent it out to Force Families as well as to our partners on the committee, which included SHARE, Child and Youth Mental Health, Ministry of Children and Families, ACT 2, PLEA, School District 43, SUCCESS, West Coast Family Centers, Simon Fraser Society for Community Living, and the Immigrant Services Society. So there was, it, it went out to a, a large number of families in the Tri-Cities area. This was done completely anonymously through an online survey tool um, that was administered by Moira and I um, uh, through the force. 
we had a total of 53 respondents, which was a pretty good response, we thought, and we came up with uh, some great information that not only showed areas that leave room for improvement, but more importantly, it suggested ways uh, that might uh, that this improvement might happen. The general results were very interesting. Uh, the survey had 21 questions on it, uh, and for the purpose of our discussion tonight, we focused on seven key points uh, that are all from the parents' perspective. So the first key point that we focused on was, did the parents feel comfortable at these meetings? Happily, 62% said that they felt pretty comfortable. They, they felt comfortable. But if you look at the flip side of that, that still left 40% of the parents feeling less than comfortable in these meetings. And these, are, these can be really important. Um, parents, we asked, did they feel adequately involved? 55% said they did. Um, we also asked, were they involved in what was to be discussed? Now, only 35% of parents felt that they were adequately involved in what was to be discussed at the meetings. Uh, the fourth point that we looked at was how many parents or caregivers felt heard at the meetings. Only 53% of um, parents and caregivers felt heard. We wanted to know how many left the meeting with a plan. Only 44% left the meeting with a plan consistently. Um, did it feel like the meeting's goals were based on the family's wishes, cultures, and values? 48% of respondents said often or always to this. And the final point that we focused on was, did it feel like the meeting's focus was on the family's strengths and needs? and only 37.5% of the families answered this one uh, satisfactorily. Another interesting point that we didn't put on the chart was that we'd like to add was that over 58% of parents had been to 10 or more meetings over the years in searching for support for the child. Um, and the number is probably much higher than that for the, for the most part. Um, some, we feel it's safe to assume that parents would like to feel more involved and heard have the goals reflect more of their culture, values, and wishes, and have the focus be on the family's strengths and needs. One of the other questions that we asked was an open-ended question. What would make you feel more supported at these meetings? There were a great many responses given, but there were five that really seemed to sum up the general, um, the general feelings that were echoed by, by the uh, parents who responded. Um, the first one that really kind of stood out was uh, a parent said, if I was told ahead of time what the focus of the meeting was. Another parent said, if I had credentials after my name to engender the respect I deserve and need to be trusted to know my son's needs and abilities. Another parent wrote, to feel comfortable and encouraged about bringing a support person, to have our opinions valued and be able to list our needs and our desires for our child first. Another parent said, I feel like I go to the meetings, leave, nothing is followed through on, then go to another meeting if I request it. Um, I would like to know the purpose of the meeting and whether or not the goals have been met. The final one uh, that we highlighted said that there is more accountability, or they wish for more accountability from the professionals who are supposed to be carrying out the plans and programs. From these comments, we noted three main themes, basically. Parents and caregivers seem to want more accountability and follow through, uh, to be informed of the process and what is available, and they want it to be understood and supported. Oops, I missed a slide. There you go. So after looking at all of that information, we started asking questions and analyzing data to see which factors, if any, made a difference to the parents' experiences and the outcomes of the meetings. We worked through a couple of scenarios, but the one that was most sig significant seemed to be if a parent had someone help them prepare for the meetings. This seemed to have a huge impact on all of the key factors that we focused on. So for the parents who had someone help them prepare, an impressive 100% of them felt comfortable at the meeting. That's a, a big improvement over the 62%. Um, a big improvement was also seen for feeling adequately involved, which went from 55% to 80%. Parents were more involved in what was to be discussed um, if they were supported in this way, with the number improving from 35% to 67%. We're going to get through the dry number stuff pretty quickly here, and then we'll get into the, the nitty-gritty stuff. Um, as for feeling heard, that increased to almost 90% from 53% of the general responses. Um, 
leaving the meeting with a plan, which is something I think is really important, uh, that changed from only 44% to a much more satisfactory 75%. We have another perfect score here with 100% of parents who had someone help them prepare, feeling that the meeting's goals were based on their wishes, cultures, and values. Finally, the score doubled uh, for feeling like the meeting's focus was on their family's strengths and needs. It went from 37.5% to 75%. So you can see that something as simple as having someone help you prepare for the meeting so you know what to expect can have a huge impact on the outcome of the meeting, how you feel about the meeting, and, and um, just how it, how it proceeds. Uh, another interesting result that we didn't put on the table was that almost 90% of the parents felt that their meetings were collaborative when they had someone help them prepare versus just 55% in the general responses. So what if you had someone help you prepare and you had a feeling that you were adequately involved? There were a number of parents who, who scored high on both of these things. Um, and we wanted to have a look and see what their experience was like. Um, well, things stayed the same in most of the key factors, but we did see improvements in three areas. Um, so it was the same in, uh, for all the results that uh, someone helped them prepare, but there were improvements in uh, feeling involved in what was to be discussed, improved to 75%. Meetings focused on strengths and needs went to almost 88%, and feeling heard increased to 100%. It would be really good to feel heard, wouldn't it? This seems to depend on if you're lucky enough to have someone step you through a meeting. Tonight we want to give you what you'll need to help you get the supports feel more like this, either by asking someone to support you in this way or give you tools so that you can start taking the steps toward it yourself. We've heard what the survey had to say and realized that there is a real need for this discussion. And we believe because we've experienced the difference ourselves that the key to this lies in collaboration. So what is collaboration? Well, we actually had to Google it because many people had different views on what collaboration really was. So uh, the definition came up as to work jointly with people, with others, cooperation, teamwork, to unite, or band together. So this slide actually illustrates the changes that the, uh, the traditional versus collaborative approach has, has taken. So before, it used to focus on the child as being broken. So they focus on the deficits, the pathology, the illness, the weakness of the child. It also had the power with the case manager instead of the family. And it focused on working within a complex, uncoordinated service system. So the good news is that it's actually shifted. So now, that with a collaborative approach, the focus is on the shift to the focus of the family within the context focus of the child within the context of the family. Sorry, my mouth is trying to catch up to my head. Mm -hmm. uh, and also a shift to view the strengths and the resources of the, all the children and families. And also to shift to recognize that the families are the ultimate decision makers and not the case manager. And the shift to focus is on changing those systems to make them more adaptive and responsive to families. So now with a collaborative approach, sorry, so now with a collaborative approach, families together with professionals assess their needs, determine the services, and set the goals for their service plans. So the team now is in control with working with the family to support the family and to meet the goals for their child, children and themselves. And what this needs to have is strong collaborative relationships between the family and the team. So how do you do that? Good question. You have to do housework. Sorry, thank you, my lovely helper here, Marlies, for changing my slide. Um, so what do you need to do this, to do this? Um, you need to do some housework. Now, luckily, this isn't true housework. This is just doing some emotional housework. Um, so I remember years ago being summoned to meetings, and I really didn't have any idea of who was going to be there and what the meetings were going to be all about. I walked in, and it looked like a G8 meeting. There was a huge amount of people around a table, and I felt really lost, and I felt like I was going to be the only person around that were actually going to be dealing with these kind of situations at this level. So some things to consider is that you are not alone in this. In the Tri-Cities, we have over 400 families that we're dealing with um, with this. 
So there's lots and lots and lots of people out there that have children with mental health challenges. And I thought I was the only one, but there's so many other people out there. So if there's only, if there's 400 families at least that we are in contact with in the Tri-Cities, just think about how many people there is across BC and maybe in your own community. Know that you hold many pieces of the puzzle. So just make sure that you share appropriately and honestly about the different kind of um, things that are going on with your child so that the team can put the right picture together for them. And don't be afraid to talk about the hard stuff. There is no shame in this. If you are feeling shame, just let it go. Leave it on the floor. Um, if you had a child with a physical disability, you wouldn't feel shame. So don't feel that shame because you're dealing with a child with a mental health issue. So if someone is shaming you, know that it's more about them and where they're coming from than about you. So don't pick it up. I remember when I started on this journey and I felt so alone and I felt a lot of shame because I felt that I was about the only person that was dealing with this. And when I would go to meetings, I felt I was being very reactive and defensive. And I just knew that they were looking at me thinking, what kind of horrors are you reining in on your child <laughs> um, to make them act that way? And I really wanted to make sure that they knew that that wasn't true. So I was really defensive about it. And I found when I started with the force that that was a common pattern for families. So I started out being very passive and thinking that the professionals had all the answers. And then after that didn't work, I became aggressive and felt like I had to go out there and fight. Um, and what I realized that it's so much more helpful to be um, an advocate for your child and become assertive. So we tried to put together some tools that would really help parents and caregivers to go through this process. So one thing to consider is to be gentle and respectful, but always be clear about what you want. And using I statements can really help. Um, are really going to be helpful to uh, saying what you need. Also using empathy so that um, to understand the other team members' constraints and what kind of parameters are they dealing with. They may have been told that morning that they couldn't offer a program or some other constraints. So really understanding what they're going through is going to be helpful. And always using gentle persistence when needed. And trust that everybody there at the table has the same goal for you. They all want to see some, your child get the support that they need. And really, you may sometimes need to give them the benefit of the doubt, but even this will help you towards your working towards your main goal. So collaboration tip number two, how do you get prepared? Well, just as you would prepare yourself for a work meeting, it's a really good idea to prepare for the, these meetings as well. And though that the force can sometimes help you prepare for these meetings, and we have some um, illustrations of that um, in our resources guide, but we don't actually attend to speak for you. We believe it's more empowering for, to get you to a place where you can speak for yourself and you're being more confident because we're not always going to be there for you. So if we can empower you to do that for yourself, um, but we can also be there as a support for you. Um, you might also want to consider dressing for success. Now this doesn't mean putting on a Navy business suit, but what it does mean is just wearing something that makes you feel confident and comfortable. And you may also want to wear layers, like for example what I'm doing today, um, because you may go into a room where the air conditioning's turned up really, really high and you're going to freeze to death. So that doesn't make you feel more comfortable and confident. So wear layers if it helps you get uh, hot and cold. And another thing, make sure you know before you go, what is the purpose of the meeting? So what are the goals? Find out, and, and when you have some great information, I found um, that it's really helpful to have it written down because a lot of times I'd have some great ideas, but I'd completely blank when I went into the, these meetings. So having it written down really helped. And know that you don't have to wait for professionals to call a meeting. If you feel that there's a real need to have one, you can actually request that. And when you're there, choose only two to three achievable goals for your child to focus on at a time so you achieve greater success. Focusing on way too many things is just going to be too much. And also, make sure the, child, the meeting is child or youth focused, or even youth led if possible. So 
with your child as they get older, there may be a time where you really need to have them advocate for yourself. And there may be um, some questions that you need to ask yourself to decide if it's a good idea for them to attend. So we actually took some information from the, some questions from the BCC PAC meeting guide, which asked some great questions. So the questions were, should my child attend? Is it a positive place for my child? If there's a lot of contentious issues going on, that might mean not be the right place. But what you can also do is, would it be best for the family, for the adults to meet first, and then actually go and have a smaller meeting with the children, so that they don't get bored sitting through the whole meeting? Is my child able to understand and participate? And also, is it okay for my child? Is, is my child okay with coming? If you have to drag your child kicking and screaming, to the meeting, it may not be the best place for them. Uh, another thing to consider is who's coming and who do you want to have there? So you have every right to suggest who you'd like to be have included, and if there's someone that you really don't want to have there, you have the right to ask for that as well. Bringing a support person, Marlies mentioned that bringing a support person with you is sometimes really helpful or having somebody prepare. So just when you try and bring somebody Try and choose somebody who's combat, who is supportive and not combative. So if you have a friend or a family member that wants to help you come and kick some butt during those meetings, that may, they may not be the best choice. And also try to work through your emotions beforehand. So if you're really angry or frustrated at something that's happened at the school or elsewhere, or you get stuck in traffic on your way to the meeting and you're just really frustrated and, and anxious, you may try and think of different collaborative ways that um, you can get what you need. And sometimes you may just need to take a breath or get there a little bit earlier, stop and have a coffee, whatever you need to do to compose yourself before you start. Um, one funny thing, many years ago an instructor mentioned to me that if you ever had some difficult issues to talk to somebody about or if you had a really um, hard request to make, that you had a lot of emotion about, it's sometimes a um, good idea to ask someone like you would ask them to pass the butter. It's really hard to make that request um, in an emotional way, so that was just one tip that worked for me. Um, another one is to sure if someone is um, making some notes because it's too hard to participate fully when you're trying to write notes and to focus on the meeting. All right, so now we're going to move on to um, collaboration tip number three. We've done our emotional housework and we've gotten ourselves prepared. Now we need to become strength focused. Um, and that means with your child, with yourself and your family, um, with the school, uh, with any other support members that, that are also on your team. Um, what you want to do is realize that these strengths are all things that you may be able to use to support your child or, or youth. So first let's talk about your child's strengths. What you want to do is think about what lights them up? What gets them really excited? What are some things that they're really good at or, or really interested in? So those can be some things that you can utilize right there. Now this, there's another piece to this and it was uh, the most fun part for Moira and I. Uh, and perhaps the most challenging, it, it, you know, um, you have to kind of shift how you think about things. And this was to look at your child's challenges and see are there any areas where those challenges could actually be counted as strengths. Um, and what I want you to do while we're, while we're going through this discussion is maybe think about your child's challenges um, yourself and what they struggle with and see if you can come up with some of your own ideas too. These are just some examples that Moira and I came up with together based on our own families and um, after talking with many of the families in our community as well. Um, so we uh, gave the example of a child who's hyper or the class clown. Uh, there's probably a fair number of you out there who have uh, one of these guys at home. Um, that might be a very difficult characteristic to be dealing with in a math class or trying to get through a spelling test. But the strength in that is that they have lots of energy and, and often this great sense of humor. Um, so a really good fit for that might be something like the drama club or um, if, if they just need to get the energy out, uh, perhaps the run club. So, you know, thinking of creative ways to, to take that 
um, thing that's a challenge in math and, and finding where it's a good fit. Um, how about, how about the bossy pants? How many bossy pants are out there? Um, I know that this is one of the challenges that my son faced. Um, now, looking at that as a strength, these, these can actually be uh, great for leadership opportunities. And many of the schools have these types of programs within the school system. Um, so looking into something like that. Um, how many of you out there have kids who you just can't get them off the screen? They're addicted to technology, they're hooked on it. Um, and, and that can be a real difficult thing. Um, however, at the school, there may be opportunities, if, if the school is willing to be open to this type of thing, where um, they can come in and consult on the technical stuff. So they can help set up a, a, a computer or you know, do a little bit of troubleshooting. Um, and it just gives a great opportunity for some positive feedback and a way to channel that. Um, how about the argumentative ones? Bet you there's a fair number of those <laughs> ones too. Um, the debate team, that's where that's a really great strength. Some of our kids are really great arguers, um, debaters, we should say. <laughs> um, how about destructive? Kids who are destructive and, and just you know want to break things, that, that frustration comes and they just need to tear things down. Um, woodworking or tech ed, that might be a really great place to channel that energy. Um, you know, they, they can get in there with their hands, they can take things apart, they can bang things together. It can be a really good fit sometimes. Um, now, those kids who have challenges with physical aggression, um, we were told this many, many times that we should sign our son up for martial arts. Um, and this is where, for us, where it really came into, um, I had to listen to my own instincts as, as a mother. And I realized that my son had a great deal of challenge with impulse control. And what I didn't want to do was to teach him how to hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. So that's how it fit for our family, but there are many families out there, and Moira had uh, a different experience. I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, her son had similar challenges with impulse control and aggression, um, and they decided to go ahead with the martial arts, and it was a really good fit for them. Um, so you need to know what your boundaries are um, and, and you know, make that decision for yourself. And, and um, for those of us for our family where we decided not to do martial arts we thought okay let's get him in involved in something that was edgy and cool um, and so we, instead we got him into hip-hop and break dancing um, and other families that we've talked about who chose not to go with the martial arts thing for that um, did, chose things like gymnastics and stuff so there are many creative ways to, to think about these things and to, and to harness that energy if you will so I challenge you guys to, to think about that yourselves the next thing um, that you want to think about are the strengths of your family. This is really key, um, you know, and, and sometimes we don't value this enough. So think about your connection with your child, your instinct, drive, and passion to find what works for your child and your family. Your ability to learn, adapt, gather people, and build a team, that's a big strength. Your own expertise with your child and family, what you've tried, what's worked, what hasn't, that's a huge body of knowledge for many of us. Uh, your family's understanding of the challenge and their motivation to make things better. And your ability to show gratitude when other support people have done a good job. That's something really uh, a great thing to build on. Now think about the school and brainstorm strengths that may exist there. And here are some good questions to ask. Um, are there any teachers, staff, or admin people that uh, may have a good relationship with your child? Um, it, it, it's um, a good thing to think about, um, you know, and these can come from the stories that your child tells. I remember my own son saying, um, you know, he got a consequence, he had to go with the janitor again today, and how much he enjoyed going out with the janitor and realizing that, okay, this is, this is a positive relationship. Um, at the school, you also want to think about, is there someone, perhaps a counselor or a resource teacher, uh, maybe even the classroom teacher, who is well versed in mental health challenges and different adaptations. That can be a really big strength if you, if you can get connected with someone like that. Um, another thing to consider is if the school or the teacher seems willing to talk to you openly, if they seem engaged or, or concerned to you. Um, this is a great opening that you can really utilize to your child's advantage. It's not the case for all families, so if you do have that uh, going on with your school, really value and nurture that. 
Um, and if it isn't going on for you at your school, then some of these tools that we're going to discuss tonight may help to engage the school in a different way and hopefully open the doors a little bit wider for you. Another strength to think of is instances where a situation was handled well. Um, so if a crisis was averted because of something that the school did or a way they handled it, um, that's something that you can really look at and build on. So, you know, think about those things. Another thing to consider is what kind of programs or courses does the school offer? Um, perhaps there's something there or something that can be developed that may help engage your child uh, in a helpful or positive way. You also want to find out what kind of jobs um, your child may be able to do in the school um, and offer suggestions that you think might best suit them, so being a special helper in some kind of way, uh, perhaps. Uh, a final thing to think about is to ask the school how they celebrate successes and give recognition to your child. Um, that's, that's an important piece to, to think about as well. What's great about all of these points is that even if they don't exist for you or they don't exist as much as you may like, these are all areas that it's possible to build up on. So thinking about strengths still, you want to do the same process for whoever else may be on your team. Now teams can be very small, it may be just you and the school, um, and, or they can be very, very large, like the G8 Summit meetings that Moira referred to. I've been to my fair share of those ones. Um, and the, some of the common players that you may have uh, involved in, in your team meetings may be uh, CYMH, which is Child and Youth Mental Health, MCFD, which is Ministry of Children and Family Development, it could be your child's doctor, pediatrician, psychologist, psychiatrist, or other supports um, that are in your community that are specific to your family and your child's needs. It may seem like a lot of work to do this for everyone who's involved, but it really is time well invested. This is how you can often uncover hidden opportunities and, it may be, and maybe even start moving your team towards thinking outside the box and finding some creative solutions to help support your child and your family. Great, so we've done the emotional work, we're prepared, and now we're strength focused. And it's time for our fourth tip, which is to look at the areas of challenge for your child. This is the most important thing, or sorry, the most important thing you'll need to do is to be prepared to openly discuss these challenges. You'll want to consider a number of things first thing you want to think about is what leads up to it and is there a pattern? For example, uh, perhaps the pattern is that your child often melts down at 11.15. Now you want to look at what leads up to it. Well, it's right after recess, unstructured time, and it's followed by math. If the focus is simply to get your child to stop throwing desks, which it was in my child's case, um, the intervention won't be very effective if the problem is really that the child has problems, challenges with social skills and then the pressure is increased because they also have challenges with math. Um, this could be a great formula for a meltdown. So really important to look at what happened beforehand as opposed to just focusing on the behavior afterwards. Another thing to consider is what is the emotion behind the behavior? What is the purpose? What is the child's purpose? So is it avoidance? Are they trying to not do something? Is it a, simply an expression of frustration? A lagging thinking skill, perhaps? Maybe there's sensory overload. Perhaps the child has challenges with transitions. So there are lots of possibilities. That's just naming a few. But these are the things you want to start asking yourself and, and digging into. Something else that is really helpful to consider is what are the similarities between home and school challenges? And what are the differences? So if your child is melting down at home and at school and there are similarities in the situation that you can pull a pattern from, you, you want to look at the differences as well. So if the child is, is melting down at home but the meltdowns are smaller, whereas at school the meltdowns are bigger, okay, well at home there's only one or two other kids, whereas at school there's 25. Um, you know, maybe there's a sensory component here. Uh, it's noisier, it's busier, um, perhaps it's that. Or is it that um, the similarity is that it's the meltdown's happening over math homework and it's happening during math class at school. 
um, math, and it might be smaller at home because you're able to give more individual attention and you can respond more quickly. So these are the similarities and the differences that you want to look into. Um, another thing to consider is what interventions may help prevent the next time. You want the focus to be on preventing it from happening, not necessarily consequencing a behavior after it's happened. You may need to do that as well, but you really want your focus to be on the prevention piece. Another thing, and, and we may have mentioned this before and we're going to mention it again, this is really key, what has worked at home? Can it be adapted? So for example, if at home um, timeouts are working well for you, or even better yet, reframing that into time to calm down um, is working well for you and, and your child seems to respond well, then encouraging the school to maybe uh, incorporate a calm down room or using break cards in the classroom. Um, perhaps you've noticed at home that um, you're able to redirect your child uh, when they're having a difficult time by asking them to come and help you do something maybe in the kitchen. Um, and then afterwards, you know, they, f they seem to feel better. So perhaps um, offering to the school that that's working really well, is there a way that they can be a helper of some kind in the school or in the classroom? Um, a co another common one is if you're reducing the workload, lessening the workload um, in one place, it may be helpful in the other breaking big things down into chunks. Um, there can also be chair ad uh, adaptations um, that can sometimes be brought into the school. So if your child's a wiggler, and um, you know sometimes the schools will be all right with putting heavy elastic bands around the feet of the legs of the chair, sorry, <laughs> not around their feet. <laughs> um, heavy elastic bands around the legs of the chair so that the kids can use them to wiggle against, or a wiggle seat. Um, these are some, just some general ideas. Uh, something else to consider that's really, really important and sometimes gets missed is what does your child do at recess and lunch? Sometimes kids with special needs get put on the back burner during these unstructured times. And these social times are the most important and need to have good planning sometimes. You may need to brainstorm ideas on how to successfully engage your child uh, during these unstructured times. Okay, we're getting there. The housework is done, we're prepared, we're strength focused, and we've really thought about our child's areas of challenge. Now comes the fun part. We're gonna match the strengths to the challenges. So you wanna consider which strengths may help support those areas of challenge directly, which strengths may help increase your child's self-esteem, uh, or even increase their opportunities to gain positive attention. And doing all that work beforehand can help you think outside the box. So for example, uh, I'll give you an example um, that our family went through. My son's strength is leadership. So he was one of the bossy ones, right? Um, the school's strength was he had this amazing relationship with uh, the kindergarten grade one teacher. This woman had never taught him, but they just seemed to really get each other. Um, and, and they had a great relationship. The area of challenge was that my son would, would act up after unstructured time. The intervention that we tried for, for a time was that he became the helper or the buddy in her kindergarten grade one class. Uh, and he would go there after recess and that would help transition him back into the structured time. What this provided was opportunities for positive attention from the teacher. You know, he got lots of positive feedback from her. But he also became the cool kid to all the little grade one students, kindergarten grade one students. They looked up to him. So it was a, a good, a feel good thing. Um, so that was, that was quite successful. Now, it didn't fix everything. It was still a very difficult year, but that was a high point, a positive, that he had something to look forward to each day. Now we're looking at tip number six, putting collaboration into action. These are the things that you can do while you're at the meeting. So you want to invite ideas from the team and share your own ideas as well. Pick and choose from suggestions. Just because something's been proposed doesn't mean that it needs to be put into action. Combine ideas, let go of others. Make sure that you're open to trying, but know your own boundaries as well. Um, and listen to your instinct, just not your fear. Um, and that can be a difficult distinction sometimes, but it's an important one to make. Um, if you're concerned about an intervention or, or an idea, ask for clarification on the purpose or the intention behind it. So perhaps the school has said, um, you know, when, when Johnny does this, we're going to send him out into the hallway. Uh, for, for 10 minutes, and you're concerned that, um, well, 
you're, you're isolating him. I'm, I'm concerned that you're isolating my child, and, and I don't think I like that. That's a boundary, okay? But you're going to express that concern with respect, and you might want to, you know, just say, okay, I'm concerned about that. I'm wondering um, what it is that we're hoping to achieve. What, what is the purpose of this? And they might say, well, we tried this before, and he was able to come back into the classroom afterwards and engage really well afterwards. Or you may be one of the lucky ones who, have a, who has a school with a, with a calm down room or a sensory room where um, the child is sent into a room that has low lights and a beanbag chair and, and you know, something very soothing. So, you know, ask more questions when you have a concern. Um, do it with respect, but, but do, do express them. Another thing to do is to look at the possible in, interventions um, or ideas and what is their intention. Um, does the consequence have the opposite effect of what was intended? So for example, um, if, if the intervention is for the child to be sent home or to the office, um, for many kids this may work. They, they don't want to be um, you know, sent home, that, that feels bad to them, so they're going to stop doing the behavior. However, it won't be effective if the child's goal is to avoid, this, avoid school or a certain task and it could actually make that behavior increase. So this is a, a, a perfect example of where your expertise of your child and your experience and asking these questions um, really comes into play. Y your expertise is so important. Another great way to collaborate is to keep the big goal in mind. You want to look at the steps normally taken to achieve that goal and see if adaptations can be made to those steps to make it more achievable for your child. So for example, if the goal is to write a paragraph and the teacher's requirements are to have proper spelling and grammar and proper capitalization and have the letters finger width apart and double spaced with the date in the right hand corner written in blue ink. Those are the steps. The goal is to write the paragraph. You can look at those steps and say, okay, what are the things that we want to focus on? Maybe in the beginning we just want to focus on the child using proper punctuation and spelling and let go of whether it's written in blue ink and whether the, the date's in the proper corner or not. So these are some of the things that you can look at when you break it down. The other thing to do is to keep the goals positively focused. Write things up as doables, not don'tables. So for example, um, a behavior don'table, which I have many of, um, maybe Johnny will no longer kick his classmates when he is frustrated. Um, that could be written up instead as Johnny will keep his hands and feet to himself and ask an adult for help if needed. Um, an academic-based don'table might be something like, Susie needs to stop handing homework in late. That could be reframed instead as Susie will hand homework in on time. What this does, it may seem like a subtle thing, but what this does it, is it helps keep people's attention on looking for the positive behaviors and focusing on successes rather than counting the times that the child fails at reaching the goal. I think it also communicates to the child that people have confidence in them and their abilities. Another thing to do is to find out what services might be available for your child that your child doesn't receive yet. Um, we've mentioned this a number of times. What is working at home? This is another thing to bring up and talk about it in the meeting. Um, here are some real life examples. I know we're giving you lots of examples, but this is, this is the useful stuff we think. Um, so there was a family in our community who found that um, after their child did some heavy lifting activities like yard work, that it seemed to really calm him down. He would come in afterwards and he would be able to get along with his siblings better, he could focus better. Um, so they brought that up at a meeting and the school was able to sort of think outside the box. Not all schools might, may be willing to do this, but this school did. Um, and it was adapted at the school so that the child was able to move boxes around the school and books and stuff. So it gave that heavy lifting opportunity at the school and, and they found that a fairly successful intervention. Um, something else that might be easier to adapt than that or, or more common would be um, a child who finds homework challenging and the parents found that breaking the homework down into like 20 minute chunks with an activity break in between was really, really useful. 
Um, the school adapted that in a number of ways by using break cards, by sending the child down to the office on errands. And these errands can even be made up sometimes. The child may not know that they're made up, but, you know, the, the school or the, uh, the teacher in the office may have an understanding. Um, and these types of things can conveniently happen during the heavy work periods that the child is struggling with, like maybe math or reading. Um, reward systems are another example of something that can um, easily be adapted. So if you've got one working for you at home, um, then it's something that the school may be able to take on. Uh, and vice versa, if the school has one that's working well, then perhaps um, somebody, or it's, perhaps it's something that can be adapted well at home. Okay, we're almost there with all these tips. So collaboration tip number seven, successful endings. So um, again, before you leave the meeting, make sure that there's a follow-up meeting. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to ones and I, there's been no follow-up meeting and I'm not sure when it's going to happen. Um, clarify the action steps. Who's doing what and when? And make sure that you hold people accountable to what they are said they're going to do on the agreed upon tasks and ensure somebody is writing up a summary of the meeting and task. Again, you don't want to be doing, left doing that. Make sure to ask for a copy of the minutes so you get a copy as well. And one thing that is often missed is reevaluation. Sometimes the greatest plans don't work for your family, so you need to reevaluate and sometimes they need to be tweaked. So just ask yourself, did it work? Should something be shifted or changed? It's not set in stone and all children are different. So what works for one child may not work for another. And if the child did not attend the meeting, find, do, make sure that they are aware of what was discussed. So do this in a child-friendly way, or even like we discussed before about having a smaller meeting where you can talk to the child about what's going on. And focus the meeting that you're having or the discussion that you're having on how this is gonna actually help your child. Okay, collaboration tip number eight, overcoming trouble spots. Unfortunately, we always have those. So, well, not always. Well, we hope. <laughs> we hope we're never going to have any trouble spots, but sometimes they do tend to creep in. So, one thing I found really, or we found really helpful, is to always bring the focus back on the child and don't engage in a power struggle. So, no no doing this with people, right? Um, and when being told that that isn't possible, you might just gently say, I understand that, but what is possible? And ask, how can we work together so that this is in the best interest of my child? Constantly bring your child back as the goal. And if you do not understand something, like we, all, we illustrated before about um, some acronyms, ask the question. Sometimes professionals are dealing with this all the time and they don't realize that the language that you're using is not what normal people would use. Um, make sure you ask for a copy of the minutes. And reevaluation is key, but it's sometimes always missed. So before the next meeting, reevaluate the plan. Now, all children are different, so what works for some children may not work for another. So decide, did it work? Should something be shifted or changed? It's not set in stone, so it can always be tweaked. And if the, child, if the child did not attend, let your child know what was discussed and try and do this in a child-friendly way or in a separate smaller meeting and focus on how this is going to help them. Collaboration tip number eight, overcoming trouble spots. So we may have some trouble spots, but this is hopefully how you can overcome it. So always bring the conversation back to the child and don't engage in the power struggle. And when being told that is impossible, you might gently say, I understand that, but what is possible? And ask, how can we work together so that the best in, that, so that this is of the best interest of my child? Constantly bring it back to the goal, and if you don't understand something, ask for clarification. If you feel comfortable, uncomfortable, overwhelmed, intimidated, just ask for a break. And put your concerns in writing. So if things are not going well and you just feel like you're banging your head against the wall, Make sure you put your concerns in writing and follow the chain of command. So for example, if you're having some issues with a teacher, try and work it out with them first. And if this is not improved, then involve the principal. And if your concern is still not addressed, then consider involving the district level. And make sure to CC people as appropriate. 
but move, do move on to the to the higher levels with caution do everything you can to work it out before moving on to the next level but you know what if it needs to be done then it needs to be done and as much as possible leave emotions out of any of your written communications or your discussions with people focus only on the challenges and the goals and what you're asking for and try and be as diplomatic as you can and if the challenge remains unsolved you can refer to helpful tips like the BCC PAC speaking up guide on pages 29 to 34 they have some great information on how to move forward constructively and you can get that at bccpac.bc.ca so this is a summary no this is a summary <laughs> and uh, so again doing the house housework the emotional housework know that you're not alone let go of any shame that you have and make sure that you're gentle respectful but always clear with your commu communications before you go write it down and also bring a support person if needed. Examine the areas of challenge and look for patterns. What's worked at home? What can it be adapted to other environments? Match the strengths and challenges and just think of ways to create, uh, um, set them up for success. Ha be open to collaboration from the team and have a great ending. So again, having it written down, following up and reevaluating. Things are not set in stone, so they may need to be tweaked. And remember, you are a very important part, part of the team and your voice counts. So this is just a listing of resources. So the FORCE website has some great information. Our website is at forcesociety.com. The BCC PAC, the Speak Up Guide that we referenced, a parent's tool to advocating for students in public school. And they can be found at bccpac.bc.ca. And also the BC Council of Special Education, supporting meaningful consultation. And they can be found at bc-case.org backslash resources. Well, thank you very much, Mara and Marlies. You've covered it very succinctly, and I think your summaries are very helpful. People can go back and refer to this uh, PowerPoint and get the tips and strategies. And I think you've covered it extremely well. Um, and uh, there's no need for summary because you've already summarized, so that's fantastic. Um, a couple of quick questions. Uh, number one, what are some ways, you mentioned about shame, and what are some ways that families could let go of shame before the meeting if they're really struggling with that and it will be affecting their confidence if they go into meetings? Mm -hmm. um, well, that was part of my section, so I'll take that. Um, you know, when I talk to people about um, children's mental health issues, um, and I tell them that there's 400 people just in the Tri-Cities that are dealing with that, it often helps them to really kind of let that go because they realize they're not alone and there's so many people. You wouldn't believe how many people I get stopped, stopping me at my kids' schools, talking to me about this when they realize it. It's almost like and when you buy a new car and you've never seen it before and then you, as soon as you buy it, you see it everywhere. So um, there's so many of us and, and please don't feel shame because um, like I said, if you, if you had a child with a physical disability, you wouldn't feel shame. So just let it go. Great. Okay. And you also talked again, this is a little bit similar to the shame, but it's about the emotions. If you're feeling angry or frustrated or again just overwhelmed and your emotions what are some tips and strategies for letting go of some of those emotions um, daily and certainly prior to a meeting um, well I yelling in your pillow sometimes <laughs> um, that can help uh, you know dealing with the emotions I think like anything um, you know even talking to your partner you just have to kind of take a step back and compose yourself and realize that um, you know, just wait until you're calm, cool and collected, hopefully, um, and uh, just take it from there. Uh, because if you're, if you're really emotional about talking about things, you're not going to get your point across, and you may be butting heads with people, so just try and be as relaxed as possible. There was a quote that I really liked from the BCC pack that said, if you speak while you're angry, you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. I like yeah. that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think connecting with someone who has a really level head as well. So if you're feeling really frustrated or angry or sad, 
um, letting that peace go beforehand by connecting with someone that tends to be a big part of our role as parents and residents as well so if, if that is something that you're struggling with uh, out there you know reach out to your local parent and residents and if you don't have somebody else around you that you feel comfortable doing that with we walk this walk we have children with mental health challenges so we really get it and um, it, it's a, a great way to let that piece go and then you can start focusing in on on the action steps and, and the collaboration techniques so okay. yeah and I think just to add to that um, I think the piece around being needing prepared and in yeah. work mode yes um, I too often say to parents um, that of course in our business life we would not go into a meeting unprepared without knowing who is in the meeting, yeah. without knowing what the meeting is even about. Mm -hmm. And it's ironic that we often, as parents, go into those meetings in that exact state mm -hmm. without knowing the purpose and not being fully prepared. So I do think that in being prepared, and as you say, meeting with your parent and residents in your community, speaking to others, being fully prepared may in fact help with mm -hmm. the emotion calming aspect of it so I, I thought that was a really good point Absolutely. and I think we may have time or we may be out okay well I think then um, just to wrap up um, I think thank you very much for your wonderful presentation I think this is going to be one of the ones that if we could measure hits on the force website mm -hmm. we would have um, we would show that this would be one that parents will be going back to over and over again um, and spreading the word to other parents because this is probably one of the most common questions that I get asked and probably you get asked. Yeah. So thank you very much and um, forcesociety.com is our website for connecting with a PIR in your area. Thank you. Thank you.